good to see each of you at the Lord's house, especially uh, delighted to see all of our folks here for family day. I know we've got some people that are guests here with us. We've got just home folks that are here and some people that maybe haven't been here in a little bit of uh, a little while. So we're delighted you made the decision to be here. Glad that we had the opportunity to come together and worship together as individual families, but also as a church family. And we want to do that today. And I'd encourage you, invite you to do that with us. Worship with us this morning. If you're able, if you would, rise to your feet. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing upon our service this morning. And after that, Brother Matt's going to come and lead us in a congregational hymn together. So if you would, remain standing. Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Again, we thank you for who you are and the reason we have to be here. And that's because of that boundless and endless love that you had for us, oh God. Lord, I pray today as we gather here to worship you that we just might lift you up with our voices and with our praise, that you might be exalted today, and that each one of us might turn our attention to you and to the sacrifice that you made for us. Lord, help us to not only acknowledge it, but help us to receive it, to act upon it. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit might move amongst us, that we might be obedient in response to it. Again, Lord, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love for us. We ask this and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I'm glad to be here this morning. 75, page 75 in your brown hymnal. Starts out with a chorus. We'll do both verses to family of God. your Bibles with you, you can be turning with me to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter 22 is where we're going to be taking our scripture from in a few moments. I'll share with you this while you're turning there. I had every intention, I had my own desire of sharing a message about family today and I had 
thought about that and been, been thinking about it, praying on it for several weeks. And uh, we're going to talk about family resemblance and what that should look like. But I, I had the Lord lead me in a different direction this week, and I, I just wanted to be obedient to Him. And, and although there is some similarity to it uh, in, in the ending of this, um, I, I don't know why the Lord does that. I, I honestly uh, wish the Lord would just send me an email like at the first of the year and say, okay, here's what you're going to preach throughout the course of this year. It would make my life simpler, but we're just going to try to be obedient to the Lord. And, and in the scripture today, we're going to talk about this thought, uh, and, and Jesus sets the example for us. He doesn't maybe explain it so much as he shows us how to be a Christian in a non-Christian world. That, that's not an easy thing to do, and we, we like to think of, of the United States is a Christian nation, and in reality, it really isn't so much anymore. We don't live in a Christian world anymore. The Christian worldview is kind of a, a second-tier notion uh, in the world's thinking, even in our, and in our country's thinking. And, and I don't think, unfortunately, that that's going to change anytime soon. Now, could it change? Yes. Could the Christians uh, be who they're supposed to be and make an influence and change? Absolutely, I believe they can, but it's not trending that way. So it, with all that said, how are we to live as, as Christ followers in a world filled with people that aren't and, and, and even kind of feel like we're being tugged and pulled against by competing worldviews? So Jesus is going to show that today in this passage. In this passage, there's two groups that come to him that we're going to see really quickly, the Pharisees and the Herodians, and they were enemies. While they both were Jews and, and had some religious background, they opposed each other, but they find a common foe in Christ. See, the Pharisees opposed the Roman tax because they, for, for a few reasons, they didn't feel like it was right to submit to a Gentile power. Uh, Caesar was revered as a god in their day, and they disagreed with that. And, and also, they felt like, probably like most of us do about taxes, that they could probably do a better job of it with handling it than the government did. So they really didn't um, like paying this Roman tax. But the Herodians were people with a Jewish background, but they were under Herod. They were his kind of political party. And they were actually the people that helped to enforce the tax. And they wanted to keep the Romans on their side because the Romans had given Herod this power. He had the authority. So they wanted to promote that. So we see here that these two groups are going to come together and they're going to try to manipulate, to trick, do these things to Christ. And like I say, he's going to show us, he's going to set this example for us and how that we should live when we're faced in a similar situation. So Matthew 22 is where we're at. We're going to read at verse, starting at verse 15, and we're going to start by just reading a couple of verses and we'll jump back into the scripture as we continue along the message. The verses 15 and 16 say this, it says, then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. So let, let's pause there for just a second and, and understand kind of how they set this stage. The very first point that we want to take note of is we need to see this plot that, that has been formed against Jesus. There's a plot against Jesus that's here in this passage, and it tells us that the Pharisees, they wanted to try to trick Jesus into ultimately, listen, the same thing that we face today, being politically correct. That's what they want to do. They want to try to trick him into saying the, the politically correct thing, so they try to trick him in two ways. First of all, they try to trick him spiritually speaking. And, and listen, we are going to have people that try to do that to us. They're going to try to trick us into saying, doing, and, and being things that we are not supposed to be. The first way they try to do it spiritually, so they send disciples of the Pharisees, some of those Pharisees that are in training, quite likely, that come, and, and they're against the taxes. They, they don't want this Roman tax, so as they come to him, they understand. They were, see, the, the Jews had been promised by God back 
even with Abraham, that they would have no one over them. They would be in bondage to no man. And they were relying on this promise. And God had even given them a law later as Moses came. And in their law was that no stranger should be over them. So now they're going to try to trick him spiritually. Say, well, if you think that we ought to have to pay this tax, then you're going against what the Bible says. If you think God wants us to do this or doesn't want us to do this, this is the kind of things that we hear and that we're going to hear. Well, the Bible says this. Well, how, how do you explain if the Bible says this? And, and, and like I say, that's not an uncommon thing that we are approached with today. That's why, for one, it's extremely important for us as believers, as Christ followers, to truly understand what the Bible says. See, it's, it's, it's really easy for us to, to pick up our phone and have this have an app where it's really handy that we can pull up our Bible all the time. And that's good. That's great. I, I appreciate having that at my fingertips. It's really helpful at times. But if that's as close as my relationship is to the Word of God, if it's never sunk into my heart and it's never made any transformation, then guess what? It's not going to be lived out through my life. So here in this passage, Jesus sees they're trying to trick him. Spiritually speaking, they're trying to use the Word of God even to do it. But not only do they want to trick him spiritually, they also want to trick him legally. They bring along the Herodians. Now, like I said, they were the ones that were for it. Actually, they're the ones that at least in the Jewish community, that are the tax collectors. If you all remember Matthew, the, the person that writes this book, He's also known as Levi, and guess what he was originally? He was a tax collector. That's what he was before he chose to forsake that and to follow Christ. He was originally a tax collector. He knows about what's taking place. He has been in that position. And and see, these Herodians, they were employees of the Roman government. So what happens when they come? I want you to notice the language that they use to Jesus. See, they try to manipulate him by complimenting him. They say, well, we know that you are a good teacher. You know your stuff. You're wise. And and they go on and say, well, we know, too, that you're a a, a bold rebuker, that you'll tell the truth, and, and, and you don't mind just being honest with people. It, it, he even uses the phrase that, that he didn't, they, that Jesus didn't care what people thought, and that was true in in the sense that he would say the truth, he would speak the truth, and they're fixing to find that out. And then it also uses another phrase that can be taken out of context if you don't understand the the way in which it says. It says, "For you do not regard the person of men." It almost sounds like you, well, you don't care about other people, and that's not. What they were saying about Jesus, they were trying to compliment him, and, and they were. And, and what they said is, you don't have favorites. You're somebody that, that you don't even care if somebody's a Pharisee, that they're some rich, wealthy, to-do person, if they're a religious person, or they're, if they're poor, if they've grown up in, in, in a bad environment, you don't care. And, and all of those things that they said were true of Christ, but why are they doing that? They're trying to do that to manipulate him. And see, the world will want to manipulate us. The, the easiest way to, to try to get someone's ear, Satan uses this trick all the time, is not to, to come at them with a hammer or an axe or a gun. You come at them with a gift. You, you, come, you come to somebody and, and you, you, don't, you don't try to put somebody on the defensive on the front side. You, you come at them and you try to, to make them feel good about themselves and persuade them. That's, again, that's how Satan attacks. That's how the world will try to manipulate us. So this plot against Jesus was, was well thought out. And it was, it was a smart plot as far as, like, I guess you might say, uh, systematically thinking it out. It was an evil plot, but it was, it was a well thought out one. Well, in, in doing that... They do all this to to try to ask him a question. They're going to set the trap, right? They're trying to bait the trap. So look at these next couple of verses. Verses 17 and 18 tells us of this proposal to Jesus. They want to give him a proposal. 
It says, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? So they go from this plot against him to now they're bringing a proposal to him. And and I want you to notice really what they're doing. Because sometimes even we as, as Christians can be guilty of this if we're not careful. They pretend to let Jesus be the judge. They said, well, will you tell us what you think we should do? How many times have we went to the Lord and said, Lord, I, I want your advice on something. We, we pray about something, but we already have our mind made up on the front side. We already have our our thoughts worked out. We have our plans worked out. We have everything in design. Sometimes we can even be guilty of this. These are the religious people, keep in mind, that are doing this. Although they're religious, it doesn't mean they were right. And, And unfortunately, even today, our our world is filled with people that are religious, but that don't mean they're right with God. I heard a well-known author and preacher, Ed Stetzer, years ago, and I may not quote it exactly right, but if I remember correctly, he basically said this, and I thought, man, that's pretty powerful. He said, the world, in Jesus' day, and even today, the lost world knew that Jesus cared about people, and he loved people, and he met people's needs. And they're confused when they don't see Christ's followers doing the same thing. I mean, that's the truth, folks. They, they knew that Jesus did good. Why do Christians not do good? See, th- these were supposed to be the, the Christians of that day. The Jews were supposed to be God's people, and they were supposed to be doing what was right. But they weren't. They were actually deceiving, trying to deceive Jesus. But in truth, they were deceiving themselves. They, they said, so are you for the taxes or not? See, if Jesus was for the taxes, the people would have been against Jesus. But if, if Jesus was, or excuse me, if he was for the taxes, the people would have been against him. But if he was against the taxes, then the government would have been against him. They tried to trick him and trap him into making a, a politically correct statement for what's going down. Let me tell you, we talked about the phone and the Bible apps and you version and all that. That's all good. Turn on, don't, I'm not telling you to do this right now. But if you turn on any social media, right there, it don't have to get any further than cutting on Facebook, Twitter, Insta, whatever you want to cut on. You cut it on. And there are traps waiting for you to make the political statement that will lead one way or the other. There's no right answer for a Christian a lot of times. Why? Because, see, Satan's good at what he does. And he's good at manipulating people so that they can manipulate you. That's what took place right here. That's what they wanted to do to Jesus. It was Satan using people. He had manipulated them so that they would try to manipulate Jesus. But he didn't fall for it. I'm going to tell you folks, one of the best things that we can do as Christ followers, how to be a Christian in a non-Christian world, is don't set ourselves up for disaster. The best thing you can do a lot of times is to log off, to get away from the nonsense. Don't set yourself up to be in a position where you're going to be faced with an attack of the enemy. If if most of us knew today, all right, if if I go south... And, and, and head out of here on 31. It's going to be a clear, smooth sail. We can go get something to eat. We can go to whatever appointed destination. But if I go north, I'm going to run into some mass catastrophe. Maybe there's going to be a wreck. Maybe there's some kind of something bad going on. Most of us are not going to head north. By the way, south goes to Tennessee, if anybody wants to know. That's, it, it is a good way to head. But, but that, that's, that's never mind. We're not going to drive into the direction to a wreck or to some catastrophe. Why? Don't do that to yourself spiritually. Don't, 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 don't put yourself in that position. 
If, if, if we dealt with, with some other type of sin, if we were an alcoholic, it wouldn't be smart to drive by the bar that we used to frequent all the time on our way home. Find a different course of, uh, of, of making your way to the house. It's the same thing here. Don't set yourself up. But see, Christ, he's, he's approached with it. And sometimes there's nothing we can do but face it. But notice what he does. Now, I'm not telling you go on the attack because that's, that's not the lesson learned here. Jesus is calling out again, remember, the religious people. He's calling out the religious people and he, he calls them hypocrites. Now, a lot of times as, as church people, we're going to be called hypocrites and sometimes it's because we are. He, he calls them hypocrites. And, and, and what it literally meant, see, that term, that mentality came about around Jesus' time. It actually originated with the Greeks. The Greeks, as, as actors, they would wear masks to portray people. And, and a hypocrite... It, comes from the Greek, which, went, which meant to wear a mask, to disguise yourself, to be something that you were not. And that's what he calls them here. He says, you're hypocrites. You're, you're pretending to be something that you're not. First of all, let me just say this. As Christ followers, we should not be that. Some people may accuse us of it, and, and, and that we can't help, but Try not to be that. Don't be something that you're not. Don't pretend to be perfect because we're imperfect. But that doesn't also give us an excuse to go and to live in sin. We should strive for perfection. But acknowledge that we were fallen. We see here that Jesus acknowledges their hypocrisy. And, and, and see, he, he wants them to understand that no one was over them, just as God had promised and the law had, had told them they should live. No one was over them as long as they followed God. The, the problem came when they quit following God. Captivity came to the Jews when they started going down their own path. The, the song the, the choir sang about earlier, it's finished. I love that song. I mean, it's, that's where it's at, folks. It was finished. When Christ went to that cross, and then that, that wasn't the end. That isn't where it was finished. It was finished on that Sunday morning when he rose up out of that grave. I mean, it was finished. And, and what that song said is that that's, that's where our freedom comes from. My freedom does not come in that flag. My freedom is found in what that flag represents. And, and, and that's what gives us that, that freedom. Today, we are only captive to what we allow ourselves to be captive of. We, we don't have to be in bondage to anyone. And, and, and it was the same for the Jews. They may have had a government that ruled over them, but their bondage came because they had placed themselves in captivity. So Jesus here is going to end this discussion with a perfect solution. May not be the decision that they want to hear, may not be the decision that we want to hear, but he has the perfect solution for the situation. Look at verses 19 through 22. It goes on and it says, show me the tax money. He said, bring me a coin. It says, so they brought him a denarius and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. He said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. This final thing, this perfect solution that Jesus brings, is he knew exactly what to tell them. He knew exactly how to respond. And, and, and he said, first of all, bring me this coin. And, and, and he asked, okay, who's, who's pictures on it? We can take out a, a, any kind of currency we got. We got some president. We got some, some old dead guy on there, right? I mean, it's, it's going to have somebody's picture on it, but it's going to say the United States of America, and it's going to have the seal, and it's going to have all that. It was the same in that day, except it was the current Caesar that was on it. It was the current ruler of the nation that was on it. What's he telling them to do? 
He says, render unto Caesar what's Caesar's. He says, first of all, honor the government. He he says, "Pay pay your taxes. Do what they're telling you to do. Understand this. Scripture is not an excuse to sin. Scripture is never an excuse to sin. It's not okay to say, well, I don't necessarily think that we should do that, or I don't want to do that. He says, you can't use Scripture to steal. You can't do that. I learned one thing really quick as I became a teenager and I started working and, and, and actually having a job where, where you pay taxes. My dad taught me one thing when we started talking about that. And, and y'all have heard this before too, I'm sure. He, he told me that there's two things that are certain in life. Death and taxes. Right? There, you may not like either one of them, but guess what? They're both going to happen. They're both coming. And, and we're, we're going to have to do that. In, in, in the 17th chapter of Matthew, before all this... Jesus, remember Jesus had even went and told Peter to go down to the water and get a fish and open its mouth and he's going to get a coin out of it to pay the temple tax. He he set the example that, listen, you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. You've got to do it. And, And whether, hear this, whether we want to or not, we have to honor the government. And you know why? Because God placed the government in its position. Now understand this. We have to honor the government as long as it's not contrary to the Word of God. And if, if, if something happens that we, we're in a situation, and, and, and I used to imagine that people were crazy when they would talk about it. I can remember my, my great uncle, who uh, he was a little older than my grandfather. He was old enough that he didn't have to go to World War II, but my grandfather did and some of his other siblings did. I can remember years ago, my great uncle telling me at, at our home church, he, he said, if it ever has to come to it, back when we built the patio of that church, we placed a Bible in a jar so that if something happened and the government ever took away all the Bibles, we knew where one would be for our church. And I thought, that's crazy. That seems silly. That's never going to happen in America. Listen, I, I don't know how many of you study history or read it. I enjoy it, uh, especially I, I read a lot of military history. I, I, I've read a lot of the stuff that happened around World War II and how Germany got into the position that it was in. It's not crazy, folks. It's not crazy. We see a, a, a country that was a very, very Christian country that was deceived and manipulated a lot of the ways that they tried to do Jesus, and we see that God was taken out of their country. That it's, it's not as crazy to me as it used to be. He was from a generation that saw that happen. So whenever we see here in this passage, we need to honor the government, but we need to do it as long as it's not contrary to the Word of God. But, but here's something I want you to notice, and it's something I want you to remember. It doesn't matter if we're red or blue, if we're left or right, or we're whatever we want to call it. We were not created in the image of our government. Unfortunately, there's far more people, and and don't take this the wrong way, but this is just the truth, that are more proud of being called an American than a Christian. And that's not right. We, We have to have our priorities right. Because we can't be the American we're supposed to be. We can't be the husband we're supposed to be. We can't be the, the, the mother or, or any employee that we're supposed to be until we're first who we are supposed to be in Christ. We'll never fulfill the title the correct way. He says, render unto Caesar what Caesar's, but render unto God what is God's. See, he tells us that we're, all supposed, we're also supposed to honor the Lord. Money, it was in the image of Caesar. But we were created in the image of God. Think about that for just a minute. You know, God could have created anyone he wanted. 
And he chose to create you. Think about that. I, I look at myself a lot of times. I think, man, I'm, I, I make all these mistakes. Why would God want to put up with me? I've got flaws. I've got faults. Why does God not give up on me? God created me. And he loved me. And he created you and loved you. In spite of whatever you've done in your past, in spite of, of, of what's going on in your life, in spite of your physical state, your mental state, or your spiritual state, God created you and he loves you. And he tells us that he not only just created us as some random being, he created us in his own image. That we should have kind of what I talked about at the first. We should have a family resemblance. We should look like him. We should act like him. We should think like him. See, Jesus, he said all of this. And it says that they, they marveled at his answer. They were astonished when he came up with this response. And you know why people marveled at Christ? Because Christ was God. He was God. But, but you know what he wants to do in the lives of his children? Even for us Christians that are living in an ever more non-Christian world, he wants people to marvel not at us, but at who he is through us. That, that's what he wants to do. He wants to use his people to point people to the cross. He wants to use his people to point people to the empty tomb. We can't do that when we're wanting people to look at us. When we want it to be about us. And you know what? We can't even direct anybody to Christ. We can't face the things of this world until we first have conformed to the image of the Father. And what I mean by that is simple. Is that we have to do what, what Christ tells us. Is that we simply have to Look unto Him as our Lord and Savior. Paul would, would explain it in the book of Romans. He says that we must believe in our minds and we must confess with our mouth that Christ is Lord. That, that's where it starts, folks. For us to be who we're going to be, for us to face the things that are before us, we have to first establish the relationship with the Father. That doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by birthright. It doesn't happen by any deed that you can do. It happens by a transformation taking place and in your heart and in your mind. And maybe you need to do that today. Maybe today the Lord has, has spoken something to you. Maybe there's some things that you've been dealing with, some struggles in your life. Maybe there's some things in your past that you haven't let go of yet. That you truly need to have that release today. He wants to make a change in you so that you can look like Him. If you need to do that today, I encourage you, I invite you to come. We'll be happy to pray with you. We've got people here, you've got people here that love you and that care about you, that would love to do nothing more than go with you through that first step in your spiritual journey. As you rise to your feet, as they lead us in this song of invitation, if you need to come for any reason, if you need to come and pray, you respond as the Holy Spirit directs. We appreciate you being here today, making the decision to join us today for worship. And, and maybe the Lord's dealing with you with something and, and you just need somebody to talk to. You may want to, to, to pray, you may want to have just some discussion. I, I'm always here at the end of service and, and I'm always available. So please come and see me, see one of our deacons or someone else here. We, we don't want you to leave out of here without us ministering to you if there's an opportunity for that. Again, thank you for being here and, and may God bless you throughout the course of this next week.